You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hi everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Puya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing choreographer Human Sharifi on body and dance. And we'll also be discussing lots of different issues from memorial services for Rehan Jabari, executed a year ago, as well as refugee rights, Quranic ringtones and why there's a fatwa against them, weddings in Kobani, as well as, of course, uh, the fact that Raif Badawi has won a human rights prize, yes. And we'll also be talking about a really important campaign, Bring Louis Home. Stay with us. There are a lot of different things that we'd like to talk to you about uh, in the week that passed. The first thing I, I guess maybe we should mention is the fact that there's news of another two boats uh, which have capsized of refugees, Syrian refugees. And it's just, it, we're going to show you a bit of the video of this. It's really heartbreaking. Um, and uh, we're again, with some children having died, women, men, and a few being saved by various fishermen and, and uh, border patrols. And what I, about this video that I really felt heartwarming, despite the tragedy, was that there's a Greek fisherman who had helped. And he had said, well, where is humanity? Don't these policymakers have children themselves? Don't they want to do something about this tragedy that's unfolding? Yeah, despite the um, open arms sort of policy for a period from Germany and other European co countries, the cri refugee crisis effectively it is still continuing and there needs to be a solution. And we've always advocated on this program open borders. And now that's the thing that I think, unless you do that, it, this is going to continue and we, we're going to face tragedy after tragedy every day. Yeah, I think that the fisherman raises a really good question. Well, what if it was your child? You know, don't you have children? Don't you have loved ones? And to imagine, you know, the fact that you, even though you're fleeing to save your life, very often that action of flight itself is so risky. You may not even be able to survive that journey, which is really heartbreaking when you think about it. And when you take away the human dimension from the whole refugee and start sort of discussing other things about borders, about security, all resources, of those things, numbers, and resources, and just, yeah. it, it's yeah. just, it's wrong. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at the situation in many countries, it gives you the, you know, the exact reason why people are fleeing. They're fleeing because they don't want to live under dictatorships, under terror, under war, and so on and so forth. Now, if we look at the question of Iran, for example, just last week was the memorial ceremonies in many cities across the world, including in Iran, of Rehane Jabari, a young woman who was executed by the Islamic regime in Iran. And the case was uh, uh, um, renowned uh, because her defense, she stood up and she was accused of uh, murdering um, a rapist, somebody who attempted to rape her. She stood her ground and the whole process of uh, media attention, publicity and campaign by the International Committee Against uh, Executions in Iran exposed the, uh, the injustice uh, of the Islamic uh, regime system of judiciary um, and, uh, and they, they couldn't tolerate that and it's exposed so much corruption in that system that exists um, and it's important to rec you know not only um, commemorate her memory, but remember that she was murdered by the Islamic regime, yeah, she, uh, unjust system yeah. of Islamic regime in Iran. Definitely, and I think that just is the reality of Sharia laws, really. It is discriminatory, it is unfair, it is brutal, and it's, it uh, applies to people everywhere. You've got people in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, uh, the good news of Saudi Arabia, of course, we have this hero of many of ours, I think just humanity's hero, uh, one of them, one great one, is Raif Badawi, who has been imprisoned in Saudi Arabia for 10 years and also sentenced to a thousand lashes for raising questions regarding religion and politics. Well, he has won the European Human Rights, the Sakharov Human Rights Prize, which is great. Yeah, and I, I think why the you know, public pressure puts uh, so much pressure on European uh, government and United Nations to act, we must so also remember and raise the stakes why the European uh, um, government, European Parliament 
do not break diplomatic relations with the Saudi Arabia. Yeah, um, I, that's the question. Why? Definitely. You know, recogn recognition of uh, Rauf Badawi is well, and we welcome that. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to do more. We yeah, can't just definitely. continue having relationship and diplomatic and sort of, sort of arms trade with the uh, Saudi Arabia, um, and and continue as if sort of okay, let's. Let's do this. Yeah, I mean, they gave a standing ovation uh, at the European Parliament uh, when it was announced that Raif Badawi won the prize. Great. But uh, very many of those very same governments are giving police training, military training and arm arming the Saudi regime. They're having very close relations with that regime. Many European governments are. And so exactly great that Raif Badawi's got the prize. But if you want to really show commitment to human rights, you've got to take that step. Um, and and break diplomatic ties, put I, real pressure on the Saudi government. It's not just Raif. There are many people in Saudi Arabia and in other countries where European governments allow you know these sort of they, they have business uh, without ever real any real concern for human and, rights. And so much violation of human rights. We, we could refer to the case of Afsana, who's, yes, uh, yeah. um, whose child effectively been adopted by. And under the Sharia law. Yeah, now this is a very uh, important case that we'd like to bring to your attention. Last Thursday, there was a protest in London in front of the embassy of the UAE. Uh, Afsane's uh, little child, uh, Louis, he has been um, uh, basically taken from her. She hasn't seen him for a while, and he is with his father in the UAE. Her f the father, who's not even Muslim, has used Sharia laws there to take custody of um, Louis and she hasn't been able to be re reunited with him. The only way she's going to be allowed to see him is when he's 18. That's just not possible. We have to put pressure to make sure that she is reunited with her son. Yeah, I think I think we need to demand that. Hopefully, we can have a discussion with Afsana later on in other programs and sort of to um, support a, this campaign for Louis to come back. To back, back home to her mother. Yeah, well, Bread and Roses is fully behind uh, this campaign to bring Louis home, as the South Hall Black Sisters and many other groups. And we are going to keep reminding and putting pressure on the UAE government until he is reunited with his mom. Uh, just as a final piece of news we wanted to raise here today was the fact that the liberty camp of the Mojahedin Khalq, it's an opposition group, uh, Iranian opposition group, has been bombarded and over 20-something people have been killed as a yeah, result. Yeah, this is a camp that the Iranian opposition group who were previously armed, now they've all been disarmed. They, uh, 2,000 of them are kept, uh, kept in the liberty camp and um, they are waiting to be uh, resettled uh, into other uh, uh, countries. Effectively, the hostage to the Iraqi government, who is pro-Iranian, and the Iranian militia groups who exist in, uh, in Iraq have plenty of military power. And um, last week, um, late last week, they uh, bombarded the Liberty Camp, and 2,000 unarmed people are subject to this, more than 20 people have, have died. And, uh, you know, we, re we, we need to protect, you know, uh, human beings effectively are trapped there yeah. and we need to support and, and call for the immediate resettlement of these people. Yeah, I mean, whatever one thinks about the Mujahideen al Khalq, I think they're a very reactionary political opposition group. They are a political opposition of the Islamic regime and no one deserves to, to die um, and to be bombarded in that way, to be kept hostage. Um, in that way, both uh, being used by the Iranian regime, the Iraqi regime, but also the Mujahideen Khalq organization uses its members as pawns in order to, uh, for, for very yeah. short-term political gains. So we wanted to highlight that uh, event for you as well. Um, yeah. I think that's it for this week, the news that we want to cover this week. Yes. Yeah. The insane fatwa of this week is from a Diobandi group, Darul Ulum Dioband, and it's um, from a mufti called Arif Kasmi, and he's an ostad. And he says that ringtones which use Quranic verses is forbidden, it's banned, it's haram, it's all of these things, it's just bad. So if you are one of those really bored people that has a Quranic ringtone when there's all this lovely music in this world. Well, listen carefully because this applies to you. You're in big trouble.
and here's why. You want to explain it to them? Because, of <laughs> because uh, this is a sacred word. You can't listen to it on, on the phone. Suddenly, you're sitting somewhere, you're having lunch. Suddenly, the Quranic verse jumps out of <laughs> nowhere in here. You've got to pick it up and answer the phone. Because, but this, this, this truncates the, the verse. So half truncated, half listening to something which you, you don't really, you're not really paying attention to, that's, that's wrong. That's what yeah, they're saying. It's wrong, it's wrong. Very wrong. And what have... It rings while you're in the toilet. Mm. You answer the phone or you let, let the verse complete itself. You're not supposed to even listen it to it in the oh, toilet. Yes, right. That's the problem. <laughs> well, come on, get, get with your fatwa. And fatwas. it's interesting, this, this group, it's in, effectively, is sort of right-wing Islamist group in Southeast Asia. And they've, they've, the, the, the mine of fatwas over there, you know, the, this gold mine over there. You can get <laughs> plenty over there. They, you know, everything you mentioned, they, they, they think is hard. I mean, recently they talk about education and uh, they, be, they should protect madrasas because education, like right for education where everybody should um, not be allowed in India because it undermines madrasas. Ah, wow. Words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. Now, we've all heard about the devastation uh, that has uh, taken place in Kobani. You've got the, you know, the brutal ISIS uh, uh, had attacked. You've got uh, the uh, freedom fighters fighting back, pushing ISIS out. And of course, Kobani, if you've seen photos of it, a lot of it is in just in complete ruins. But there's this lovely photo that we wanted, we've chosen this week as our slice of life because it's, you know, of a wedding taking place amidst those, the ruins. Absolutely, and everybody remembers you know, international support for Kobani and people of Kobani to push back ISIS, and the result is, you know, amidst the ruins, suddenly you have the beautiful sort of wedding of a couple. I mean, that's, life continues, beautiful life continues post-ISIS. Yeah, and that's the thing, that ISIS and the Islamists, no matter how bleak and how dark and how brutal they are, life always goes on somehow because humanity always manages to shine through. A few months ago when I was at an international art festival to speak on a panel, I came across this wonderful Iranian choreographer who was the art director of this fantastic show about women and their bodies um, called Birthmark. Listen to an interview I did with him and then we'll come back to discuss the issues further. Stay with us. Welcome, Homan. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about your uh, recent, the show you're having here at the Bergen Festival called Birthmark. What's it about? Birthmark is uh, asking five female choreographers to come and work with the company. Uh, so I'm an artistic director of Cat Blanche, which is a Norwegian national contemporary dance company in, based in Bergen. So we are based here. And um, one is my first programmation as artistic director. So I want to do focus on different issues every time. Of course, you cannot uh, impose on choreographers what you work with, but I could basically talk about what kind of, what, where my choices are from. So then I choose to focus on feminism and choose five strong choreographers, female choreographers, which coming and working with a company and making performances. And we also pre, we produce also a magazine where we have asked different writers to talk about uh, feminism and body and female and I mean so these are the issues that we've been working with for the last half year now for this production why uh, why the body and feminism I think dance has using its body for, for a long time I think the body the body of female has always been as also certain how to say um, power or has been misused or used within art as a female feminist artist you always have like have imposed or exposed to your, your body in, in a sense you in all religion you hide the body or you so it is something that is extremely basically goes through the whole line of as a dan with the dance and also art society and also religious I mean or any other so these are the so body would be extremely important as an issue um, so I think that's why why was one of the issues that we work with 
So, for example, there is there was also this discussion. For example, what we have working with Lina Sane, which is which is um, Lebanese choreographer and and and, uh, and director actually. And there was this discussion that she had three texts after each other about underwear, where only females are talking about their underwears. And some people are reacting that why are they why only female are talking about their underwears, not men. And I don't know, it, something came to me, I don't know what Lina means in a sense because I haven't talked to her properly about it, but it is something like suddenly reminding my mother which talks about uh, the idea of that her gender is hers, that her body is hers. So this kind of could be a certain like Middle Eastern move, female movement that to, to basically to talk about my underwear and my sensuality as a female and my lust for, for love, for sex, is actually an act of freedom. It's not an act of, uh, which could be different in in maybe a, a European society. That ah, if, if male also can talk, you know, like this kind of this right distribution of something. While if there are a society that there is not right distribution, so then why should we talk about right distribution? I mean, what, what sort of um, what's your aim with this production with Birthmark? What are you trying to do? I think. Uh, as we, I think it's always as a, let's say, as a institution supported by a government, a governmental institution, as a certain name called Norwegian National Contemporary Dance Company. I think part of your job is also not to forward and create amazing art, but also to see what kind of, how do you use the space that is given to you, the, the mandate and the voices and the how, with what do you occupy a public space with? What kind of messages, what kind of information do you give out? So this was, I think, which has been a drive for me anyway as an artist and now as artistic director in the sense that this... And, yeah, coming from Iran also to find out, you know, and looking at how difficult it is for different people in different places to say what they want to say or finance what they want to say. And so, so in a sense, when you sit in a... I think it's it's important to discuss this thing, which also we heard earlier in the discussion, that, that you know what is the value of the luxury of freedom, and what is actually the potentiality of it, to how and how to use it. And why the name birthmark? I think birthmark came. came we, were, we had lots of discussion because we need to give a title to to a program. And we had a discussion of what could it be, and we didn't want it to be a long title because it's done, and we didn't want it to become very like narrowing the project because we hadn't started narrowing. The title comes far before the project is started, so then how could you make a title which is appealing at the same time it says something at the same time it doesn't closes the project that has come in because then you basically impose this name on on the choreographers which are going to come and make their own pieces. And birthmark came in the sense that, that it has to do, that in a sense our gender is something we carry as our, our mainly, what's called, the most visual birthmark that we have, in a sense. So this is, so, and of course sometimes we are not happy with our gender and we want to change it. So, and of course, then you change it, but you still carry it in, in a sense. So this is our, it's not our this small hidden birthmark, but it's really the, the biggest birthmark as, as you see. So the first, I'm looked at as man. I would be looked at differently if I was a woman. So that, in a sense, this, the, that's my mark, basically. And that's what I've been born with. So that's like my most visual. I could be anything in, at a certain point. Yes, you can pinpoint me by the color of my skin or, or a look or something like that, where this person comes from. But in a sense, my main, to be man, it's just a bit difficult to get around, basically. One final question about your Iranian background. How yeah. does that affect the work you do? It's very painful. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm struggling like hell to be Iranian. <laughs> to carry this centuries of culture, it's very demanding. No, no, of, of course, I think it's. I'm extremely proud of of the the Iranianness and uh, and in a sense of and I'm extremely proud of my Norwegianness in a sense and I think this doubility is very interesting and I'm trying to constantly keep and deny to change it. I I think so. Of course, I'm 
I'm a child which was six when the revolution came, so young but at the same time rememberable. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm a children of war and I'm a children of extreme changes of a country and I'm coming to a country which is very stable, very op I mean, in a sense, relatively open and, and, and have different cultures. I think, um, I think most of the things I do, of course, is coloured by my history. So, you know, you have the Norwegian, uh, as a cliche, you could say you have this Norwegian concreteness that the table is a table and the Persian uncleanness, which nothing is what actually it is, and the extreme poesy of existence, in, in a sense. And, and uh, so I think this mixture, it's actually a luxury to be able to pinpoint and b basically move as a being in between these two possibilities. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I, I really think Human Sharifi raises some really interesting points. I, I don't know where to start, but I guess one of them is this fact that, you know, talking about women's bodies and women's rights is also something that is pro men's rights because the more rights women have, the better off men will be as well. Because it's a reflection. How could, how could a woman sort of uh, uh, not be free and then men be free, just impossible. So it is a reflection on men and the whole of humanity, I think, as um, uh, in both sexes. So it's impossible. So when you talk about feminism, for example, or uh, liberation of uh, women, and men need to recognize this is part and parcel of their being complete. If you, it's impossible for uh, uh, a man to be liberated without a woman's liberation. So I think that's, um, that's the key for me from the interview. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think it, that, that is an important point, though, because very often you do find that when you go to, let's say, a women's rights conference, there'll be mainly women there. Mm. And the fact that it is seen to be a woman's issue, and I, and I think he so brilliantly explains that it's not, it's a human issue, and how relevant it is for the liberation of humanity in, in general. Uh, and I also, I mean, I think the, the point of, you know, the body and how it's used and abused by religion, by nation, nationalism and so on and so forth, and even how it's used uh, in the arts to give a message, to bring messages. And, um, you know, the, what, how key this discussion around the body really is when we're talking about women's liberation as well. No, absolutely. And I think and if a body is a key, somehow it symbol, symbolizes both the oppression and uh, an incompleteness of a uh, human being because if, if body is targeted, a woman's body in particular, is targeted as something sacred while at the same time being managed and, uh, and controlled, uh, that uh, you know, is, is a reflection on men as well and I think that, that's the key uh, for me in, in, in the discussion when it comes to women's body, uh, naked protests, that, you know, the discussion we had, all the discussion we've, we've had with, uh, with, Human, uh, with Human Sharifi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think in a sense when you do hear what he says, it does put uh, nude protest as well in, in its place. It shows how important it is to challenge perceptions of the body, control of the body, and to also also be able to use the body which is often used as a form of oppression to oppress women but to use it as a tool for liberation. Um, anyway I hope you enjoyed this week's program and um, enjoyed the discussions. Please do keep writing to us, tweeting, Facebooking us. We always look forward to hearing from you. We also are very grateful to a few new patrons that we have. So thank you for that. It's the patrons that are keeping us going. So thank you and keep telling your friends and loved ones and colleagues about us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we support us as much as you can. Spread the word, you know, send the links and share it with everybody. And, and that brings us to the end of our program. And until next week from me and... Mariam, have a good week. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. 
We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.